if they don't make a second purchase within 60 days, you know, we've, we've probably lost them as a customer in terms of making repeat orders. Hey, my name is Felix Tia, and I'm the host of Shopify Masters, a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how your approach to business transforms when you're able to work on it full-time, how to onboard new customers with emails so they can get the most out of your product, and how to catch a viewer's attention in the first five seconds of a YouTube video so they don't skip your ad. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Cadu from Supply. Supply is an independent online retailer of premium grooming gear for guys that demand the best. It was started in 2015 and based out of Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks, Felix. Happy to be here. Yeah, so one thing you told us before we got going uh, uh, in the pre-interview was that you quit your cushy six-figure job to build your business full-time. Tell us about that experience. What did you see in the business that made you take this jump? Sure. Yeah, that's actually a great question to start um, because I'm constantly looking for um, the right metrics to inform me you know, on the health of our business. And that was a really important thing um, when I decided to kind of make the leap uh, from the corporate world to uh, doing this full time. And um, for me, it was just uh, at that time, you know, the metrics we track now are, are very different. But at that time, it was um, the growth that we were seeing month over month. Uh, it was the demand for the products that we were seeing. Um, you know, we, we, were, we, we grew slowly. We, we can get into this later. We were a Kickstarter company. Basically, at first, we launched on Kickstarter. But as we started to see more demand for our products online, I figured that we really had something. And uh, really, you know, frankly, it just came down to I was doing this on the side and I was working full time and it got to the point. I always told myself that when it got to the point that I could do, I could no longer do both jobs to my full capacity and to where I was proud at the end of the day, having done my best at both jobs, then it was time to kind of make a decision. And I was getting to a point to where um, the work that I was doing on the side was really starting to get to the point where it was affecting my day job. And so that's when I really knew I needed to make a decision to kind of, uh, leap or, or, or shut things down. Yeah. I think this is a situation a lot of entrepreneurs are in where they are doing this on the side and then it just kind of carries on for a long period of time where they're just spreading themselves more and more thin and don't realize it. Were there certain things that you looked for in your performance, either on the business that you're running on the side or in your full-time job that made you recognize, like, okay, this is the limit of what I can do of me juggling both and I'm just going to take the jump into the business? Yeah, uh, specific things. Um, gosh, I got to think back. Um, I mean, a lot of them were personal to me. You know, I was traveling internationally a lot for my full-time job. And at that time, you know, it was just me and my wife running the business. And so we were packing orders and, you know, there, there were real physical limitations to being in a different time zone and uh, having, to, having to pack orders and answer customer emails. So that was real personal to me. But um, I think the real kind of number, um, the uh, number that I came up with that, that um, I made a distinct decision of it's, it's okay. And it's time to jump was kind of looked at my personal finances. I looked at how the business was doing. I looked at how much cash we had in the bank and I kind of made some back of the envelope calculations of, you know, if, if things don't get better than they are now, um, then at the very minimum, I can, I can last about a year, uh, kind of given this one really good shot. And that's really kind of what it came down to for me was, if I don't give this my all and just really go after it, uh, I'm going to regret it forever. And um, so I, that was kind of a mental decision based on, um, you know, also based on uh, the numbers, trying to figure out, you know, if, if I got a year to give it to this, um, we'll see in a year if we're successful. And uh, if not, then, then we'll shut things down. And I think you told us too that you did this last year. So has that year come yet? That's correct. Yeah. So I left my full-time job actually February 1st of uh, 2017 was my first day. So we, we're about a, we're almost, we're coming up on maybe two years of uh, doing this full-time. So um, yeah, we've, we've decided this is working and we're, we're going to keep on uh, pushing. We, we continue to grow month over month about 
10 to 15 percent a month and so we're we're excited uh, for the growth that's ahead very cool what recommendations do you have for people that are still in that phase where they are balancing between that full-time job and running something on the side hmm that's a good question almost two years can make you forget things real quickly mm-hmm. uh you know I guess one of my biggest recommendations would be um, invest in tools. As long as you, of course, have kind of a, the the margin in your budget, um, but the the most you can invest in tools that um, either automate or take care of all the manual things that you should be doing. Um, that's really kind of what helped us, um, you know, manage not only a full time job but a but a part time job. So everything from customer service. Um, you know, we were at the time we were doing, um, kind of chat bots that would help, help our customers kind of do self-service, uh, to all the amazing tools that, you know, many of your listeners are probably familiar with everything from how Shopify plugs into ShipStation and, um, inventory planner to, to plan your, uh, purchases and QuickBooks. There's all these kind of connections that we've, we've really built a foundational, you know, kind of software stack. It really manages a lot of the manual stuff so that we can actually think about growing the business and, um, you know, not spending so much manual time doing all those tedious tasks. So that, I think that would be my biggest suggestion is really think long and hard about what processes take you so much time and how can you automate those. And another thing I didn't mention is Zapier is also a great tool that we use that helps us do that as well. Yeah, definitely. Zapier is one of my favorites as well. What what did you, so once you're able to quit your your day job, what were you immediately able to do that maybe you weren't able to do when you're balancing both? Like what was something that you hit the ground running because now you had the, the, you know, X number of hours freed up and X number of brain capacity freed up to focus on the business? Yeah, I mean, I won't say it changed overnight, but it, it really... Um, I mean, within the first couple of weeks of doing, doing our business full time, it really changed how we, how we operated. So, um, first of all, I got to think more strategically about our business and what I wanted coming up over the next anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, so that led to, you know, a full redesign of our product line, a full redesign of our packaging. Um, it, it led to what we called our version two of our razor. Um, that we launched on Kickstarter, actually just a few months after I left my full-time job. Um, that, that Kickstarter campaign raised, um, I think, between both crowdfunding platforms, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, I think we raised a little over $300,000. Um, and so, so that was a really, um, I, I credit the, the development of that campaign and, and the thinking through our strategy with actually having clarity of mind to kind of think about what we wanted to do and, and who we wanted to be as a brand. So our, our uh, website got immediately better with better product photography. Our social media got better. Our products got better. Our customer service got better. And, it, and it's all just because I was um, thinking ahead and being more strategic about how I wanted to build our company and more importantly, build a brand rather than just kind of reacting to what happened during the day while I was at work and, you know, uh, trying to put out fires at night, if that makes any sense. Right. So you move from this reaction mode to be able to see things at a higher level and be more strategic and plan quarters ahead rather than just like, how can you tackle this week or this day? So let's talk a little bit about the the first kind of products you sold. So we talked about you as an independent online retailer, premium grooming gear. What did it, did it start with multiple products? And what did you guys, what was like the very first product or products that you were selling through through your store? Sure. So uh, we view ourselves as a uh, wellness and lifestyle brand that sell, sells beautiful, high-quality products direct to our consumers online. Uh, we, we like to say that we, we solve real problems for real men. And uh, so the way, so that's a big, lofty kind of vision statement. But the way that works kind of on the ground right now is through our shaving and our grooming uh, product line. And so we started with the razor. So we, we sell a solid stainless steel single blade razor. Uh, it provides a supremely close and comfortable shave without the irritation and ingrown hairs that often come with multi-blade razors. And um, uh, a large percentage of men, uh, many men that I talk to, either struggle with irritation, ingrown hairs, or 
or just frankly, just a dissatisfaction with their, their shaving, um, ritual in the morning. And so we've always viewed the fact that if we can prove to our customers that we can deliver a fundamentally better experience when it comes to shaving, uh, then we've won a customer and, <clears throat> excuse me, we've won a customer for life and we can, t- can continue to sell them other products that we um, believe will solve additional problems in their life. So all that to say, we've got a foundational product line that, that uh, is just these premium um, shaving products. And we view that as our foundation to build future products on top of. Um, so we're currently planning uh, an entire skincare line, uh, body care, hair care, um, and additional products in the future that will continue to um, uh, build out that product line and that brand that we're trying to build of a brand that men can trust as products that, um, that are effective and powerful and solve problems that they're experiencing in their lives. And what's your background? How did you come across this niche or how did you choose this niche? So, um, so I'm, my background's in engineering. I'm a, a mechanical engineer, um, by uh, study, and I spent uh, eight years in the aerospace uh, industry. About half of that uh, was in um, the Skunk Works, uh, which is kind of this infamous uh, aerospace uh, division of, of a company called Lockheed Martin, um, some of the world's um, uh, most advanced fighter aircraft were made in that division. I spent about half of my time there, and then another half of my time there was spent on uh, a fighter aircraft called uh, the F-35 Lightning II, so stealth aircraft. And so that, um, that background coupled with um, this actually very uh, interesting interest in uh, shaving kind of came together to make uh, the, the products that we have today. So um, I designed our razor. If you, if you look it up, it's um, pretty modern and, and futuristic looking. I kind of took, some inspiration from vintage razors that I had used um, and found off of uh, forums. So believe it or not, there's a, there's a forum for everything. And there's um, whether you know it or not, there's forums for uh, vintage shaving. And so um, I'm members of these forums where guys get together and talk about their kind of vintage razors that they use. And so um, I got into this style of shaving um, that, you know, our, our grandfathers used to shave with these style of razors. And, uh, so I I had this real passion for that, um, kind of niche, but then I wanted to bring it into uh, a kind of modern day design. And so I kind of combined that passion with my background in engineering and, uh, designed this razor and, um, put it up on Kickstarter and, and here we are today, three years later, still going. Can you say how large you've grown the business since the beginning? Yeah. So, um, it's, it's hard to compare where we are today with where we were when we began, because for the first year and a half, really, we were, we were just kind of Kickstarter only, um, which is, which is a complete contrast to where we are today, which is almost entirely direct consumer through our website. Um, but, um, so, so I really view, uh, growth metrics, um, over the past kind of year that we've been in business really online fully. And uh, so, so we're seeing about, uh, on average, 10, closer to 15% monthly growth. Um, and then year over year, we're, we'll, we'll, we grow about uh, 2x every year so far. That's amazing. Did you ever imagine that when you first started the business that it could get to this point? Or were you just kind of looking to start something on a side and to kind of keep it there? Never. I, I never imagined. I mean, I always hoped. Uh, this has always been a dream of mine to to run and and operate my own business. So I always hoped, but I never imagined. You know, I, I just it started with uh, kind of a passion project. Uh, like I said, we got our start on Kickstarter, uh, our first campaign when we launched our razor. It, it raised eighty thousand dollars, and um, you know, I was on top of the world then. But um, I never could have imagined that it would turn into more than just kind of a a project and actually turn into a real business. Yeah, and I've heard of entrepreneurs using Kickstarter as a way to validate the market, validate that product market fit. Did you use it for that same purpose, or were you able to to validate that there was a fit for your product in the market prior to Kickstarter? Yeah, so we launched in August of 2015, and that was kind of um, 
So it's interesting how Kickstarter has changed over the years. Kickstarter kind of tends to be more of a, uh, a sales platform now than, than maybe um, kind of uh, product validation or actual crowdfunding. But at, at that time, I mean, I was really interested in crowdfunding and, and validating if this was even a good idea. I had done zero research ahead of time, uh, zero market research. Uh, this was just something that I thought was cool and that I hoped other people would like. So um, our goal was $20,000, and I really viewed the campaign as market validation. You know, I figured if we could raise $20,000, then, you know, there might be something here. And like I said, we, we wound up raising 80 k and um, so that, to me, was really the only market validation we did. Yeah, and how, how much, like, time or money did you invest in the business or in the product before you went over to Kickstarter? We, we started in January of that year, so it was about eight months of um, research and development and prototyping and design, um, and then, of course, campaign preparation before we actually launched the campaign. Um, I, I can't say whether or not that's typical for, you know, for other creators, but that was, you know, th- there, was, there was a solid eight months of, of prep for the campaign, including actually designing the product that's from like idea to actual campaign was eight months for us right so you mentioned that one of the the strategies that you're taking for marketing is that you will get them to use the initial product that that razor proves to your customers that you can deliver a better experience and that they're going to get a great experience if they use other products of yours but how do you get the ball rolling on this like how do you prove how do you first of all how do you prove this and then how do you get them to give you a shot to prove it Sure. I mean, that, so that's definitely one of our challenges is uh, c- convincing customers to try our products um, or, or specifically to try the razor because 95% of the time that's the first product they buy from us and then they continue to buy other products. Um, so it's, it's casting this vision through advertising, through uh, content marketing, through uh, social media of um, really we're, we're, we're trying to convince men to wake up from this myth that they've been told all these years and that uh, corporations have poured literally billions of dollars into advertising them to believe that you need five blades and a razor to get a better shave. And it's absolutely not true. And I know you've had other uh, founders on the show, both men and women that uh, have, uh, um, have caught on to this. Um, in that you don't need five blades to get a better shave. And in fact, um, with a little bit of practice and time that you're willing to put into the, to the process of learning how to use a single blade, it'll give you a far closer, more comfortable shave than any five blade razor uh, you can imagine. So there, there's a lot of, um, content advertising and then, um, uh, and branding that we build behind that, message that we're trying to tell our customer and it's definitely an uphill battle when you're when you're battling um you know kind of ingrained uh, customer behavior that has been uh you know developed over the past 20 years uh that people believe you got to have you know a pivoting head and a loop strip and and five blades and you know vibrating handle to to get a better shave and it's it's simply not the case right and you see you solve this you tackle this problem by education and through, through content. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Like, how do you know what kind of education or how you should be educating your customers when you are not just selling them a new product, but then selling them a new way to think about using products like yours? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it, it's something that we are constantly thinking about and constantly trying to get better because, um, uh, I mean, ed- education is kind of one of our biggest challenges. So we do it through, um, and, and I like to consider it, um, there's kind of two phases. There's the um, kind of acquisition of a customer, so educating them to be interested in purchasing the product. And then there, once they purchase the product, there's the onboarding of the customer. So there's certain um, techniques they have to learn, and, and it's really simple. It's, it's nothing really to be, you know, kind of scared of, but there's, a, you know, there's, there's kind of a relearning of the shaving uh, that they need to do. And so in acquisition, it's... Um, Frankly, it's, you know, Facebook ads, it's YouTube ads, it's uh, Instagram ads. Um, and, and in these ads, they're either videos or images. You know, for example, we're running one right now that, um, uh, you know, it shows side by side, you know, the difference between shaving with a single blade and shaving with three blades. And, and it's a little graphic that, you know, video graphic we've created where 
the three blades, you know, they pull the hair up and they cut the hair and then they, they cut the hair under the skin. And that's what causes um, ingrown hairs. And a single blade instead cuts hair at the surface of the skin and, um, and avoids uh, ingrown hairs. And so that's an example of kind of education we're trying to do. And then once we actually acquire a customer uh, through those efforts, then there's a whole series of emails that uh, we send to customers to help onboard them so that they get a better experience with our products. Um, everything from our packaging to our instructions to the inserts we put in our boxes, those have all been really meticulously thought through um, to try to make sure that once a customer actually gets our product, they know exactly how to use them. Yeah, I like this approach of uh, onboarding a customer because a lot of times people make that sale and that's it. That's the last time they talk to them. But there is such value in being able to continue the conversation and get them to get the most value out of that product because now they recognize that they are getting great value out of your products and they want to buy more from you, whether that means more of the same product or more or different products because now they have that trust that, 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 that they've given you. So during this onboarding process, especially through emails, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you educate through there? Like, should you be sending like, you know, 20 minute long videos? Should it be, be short? Like to the point, like what's the, the structure of these onboarding emails? Sure. So, um, uh, the, the minute somebody places an order, um, they obviously get all the Shopify, you know, order confirmation, but then email, but then they get an additional email from us. It's actually direct from me. And it's just, it's just a letter from me. It's nothing fancy. You know, it's not like this flashy graphics. It's a letter from me telling them, some of the things they need to pay attention to and they're using our products. And then at the bottom, there's a link to actually a video of me um, pretty much saying the exact same thing, but in video form. And that's something um, we always try to try really hard to do is make sure that people can consume the content we send them in multiple different ways. So in that email, it's, it's text and it's video. And some people want to read the text and some people want to watch the video. And so I include both of those in that email. Um, they continue to receive order updates over the next kind of two to three days, all the, all the default Shopify emails. And in all of those emails, I think there's a, your order is shipping, your order is out for delivery, your order has been delivered, you know, in each of those emails, um, which, um, you know, is hopefully no surprise to any of your listeners, which, which are the most open emails that your customers will ever open. The very first thing I, I have in them is a little note from me and, Hey, uh, you know, check out these tips to getting the best shave out of your brand new razor it's right at the top of that email before you even get to, um, you know, the tracking information, which is what everybody's looking for in those emails. And then um, three days, I think it's three days. No, actually, it's seven days. I'm sorry. Seven days after um, they, they get their package, they get a follow up email from me saying, how's your how's your order? Is there anything I can do to help you? Oh, by the way, if you're having a hard time, let me know. I'm here to help you. Um, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Or if you love your razor, please leave us a review um, here. And then they can click a link to leave a review. So it's that kind of process, which, by the way, we, we get tons of replies to that email, that last one. Uh, that's how we get the majority of our reviews um, with that email. That's cool. I was going to ask about the one-on-one -on -one consultation. I really like this. How does this work? How does the consultation work with the customer? Sure. Yeah. So uh, we honestly don't have a whole lot of people take us up on it, but um, it's just uh, you can book a Skype call with us. And so there's a, you know, face-to-face. -face. Sometimes you just can't accomplish trouble, you know, shaving, troubleshooting over email. And so um, sometimes it's just best to hop on a quick video call and, and that's how to help uh, customers out. When do you promote that, that next product that's in your catalog? At what point do you present it to them or market it to them? Yeah, so actually, um, we're, we're starting to get better at that right now. Um, we've recently uh, uh, kind of overhauled our email, um, our email program. So we've switched over to, to Clavio right now, and we are setting up all these flows actually right now to start to kind of nurture our customers after we excuse me, after they uh, purchase from us. So, um, and, and this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, which is really being data-driven in your approach to making decisions. So we know on average, you know, a customer will lapse if they don't make a second purchase by six, around 60 days. And that's, I think that's probably pretty standard for e-commerce. 
if they don't make a second purchase within 60 days, you know, we've, we've probably lost them as a customer in terms of making repeat um, orders. Of course, that's not true off the, uh, across the board, but that's on average. Uh, you know, you want to be able to get a customer to make a repeat purchase within 60 days. So um, we're trying to educate them about additional products um, that they should be buying and, um, and, uh, and selling them additional products that we think they would like. So, for example, if they buy the razor, there's a stand for the razor they can buy. There's a, um, there's a case, leather case for the razor they can buy. There's, of course, shaving cream and aftershave and, and all these additional grooming products that they can buy. And so we're educating them about these products and then occasionally asking for the sale. So it's, you know, we're, we're not always asking for the sale, but um, uh, we're, we're trying to kind of educate them about how the additional products will really improve their, their morning experience. Got it. So you mentioned to me as well about how you had a baby. And then, of course, we talked about how you had a full time job while doing all of this. Now, based on what you've learned so far, learned through this process, if you were to do it all over again, how would you spend your first 30 days, especially when you had all these things going on to actually make the most impact with each day? The 30 days after um, I left my corporate job? No, just like 30 days. If you were to start all over, start a business all over again, how would you how do you recommend people out there? If they're in this situation, how should they be spending their days to accomplish this? Because I think a lot of people are in your, the same shoes as you. How would you recommend they spend their days? Yeah, uh, I would spend a lot, a lot more time thinking about um, how do I acquire customers and how do I retain customers over time, uh, which could also, you know, be translated to what is the lifetime value of my customer, right? And I had no clue what either of those words meant. But customer acquisition cost and lifetime value are the most important, two most important metrics that any entrepreneur starting a business should be thinking about. Um, and they don't have to have all the right answers, but the sooner you can think about what's it cost to acquire a customer and how many times are they going to continue to buy from me over time, the better off they are. And I, I wish I had thought about that much sooner in my entrepreneurial career. So, so um you know, let's just say I was starting a razor business all over again. I would think uh, real hard about what channels am I going to use um, to advertise and to promote my products. It's probably going to be, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Google, YouTube. Um, how much do I think it will cost, you know, to acquire a customer on that channel? Um, if you have no clue where to start, you know, there's plenty, you know, there's plenty of articles out there you can Google on and acquisition costs for similar companies like yours. Um, you know, depending on the product, it could be anywhere from 15 to $50. And then, you know, how, how are you going to keep that customer coming back over time to continue to purchase products from you? So, um, and, 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 um, and what are you going to do to encourage that? Because left to their own devices, customers, unless you just have some crazy, amazing, product and they just can't stop thinking about you every second and every day, most customers are, you know, just going to kind of slowly forget about you because they're just bombarded with so much noise, you know, in their feeds and um, just in their everyday lives. We're all so busy that you got to really think about how are you going to retain that customer and get them to continue to come back and buy from you for time. So I would think a lot harder about, um, What's it cost me to acquire a customer and and what's the lifetime value of that customer after I acquire them? And are you saying this because you spent a lot of money on channels that were ultimately unprofitable because you didn't go through this exercise? No. Um, I'd say for me in particular, our acquisition cost has been um, pretty steady across the board over the past year. So um, it, it's always been where, you know, good enough for us. Um, what, what personally we failed to do until just recently is think more critically about lifetime value. And that goes back to, you know, the previous question you asked, which is how are you educating your customers and getting them to continue to buy extra products from you over time? Um, and so that personally, um, we didn't do a great job of retaining customers, um, towards the beginning of our company. Cause we, we were more focused on, okay, can we actually sell these razors? Like, will, will people actually buy them? And so that's what, that's what we were spending all our time thinking about um, and, and less time about, okay, how, 
what do I need to think about to get customers coming back to purchase our products? Because, um, you know, the first thing that people go to is, well, they got to come back and buy razor blades, you know, and that's true. But uh, one of the problems with our business model is currently um, every pa- every razor comes with 20 blades. And so those blades last them roughly six months and even longer, um, sometimes up to eight or even 12 months. So um, we're starting to rethink about, you know, if they're not coming back for blades, then, then what are they coming back for? And so that's that's what I would go back and tell myself to think a lot more about. Right. So is it, I, I see what you're saying. I think that this is like a, a, a stage that you, you've reached, right? Where you recognize, okay, we've certainly know how to optimize that front end revenue, front end profit, but now how can we extend this and have these back end offers and have these like uh, more upsells and get them to extend that lifetime value? Do you think it's, do uh, you think that it could be, could have been too overwhelming if you, if you start off on thinking about this all the way through about how can I get them to buy the razors, but then also how can I get them to buy razors? which might not have yet like do you think that, that there's a certain time for that kind of focus i mean with the benefit of hindsight i think the time to think about that is is from the very beginning and, and again like you know if you're a small company like we are you're not going to have all the resources nor the knowledge to implement all the systems that you got to implement to to build out a really robust you know customer retention uh and uh, and a program and frankly to build a brand that people identify with and want to continue to shop with over time. So, so, I mean, if, if you're a one person, two person show, I mean, that's really hard to get all that in place, you know, up front. but um, the time to start thinking about it is, is from day one. Um, You know, because the, the, the worst thing you can do as an entrepreneur is waste 12 months on a business model that, that really has no legs, right? You know, that's the last thing I want to figure out is, 12 months from now, well, I didn't really think through the fact that it cost me a hundred dollars to acquire a customer and I'm losing $50 on every sale. You know, you just lost 12 months figuring that out. You really need to think about that up front. Are there tests that you can run up front to determine this? Because let's say that you are just starting out for the first time and you don't know if you're going to be able to have a low enough uh, acquisition cost or high enough lifetime value that, that there's margins for you to take. Is there a test that you could run if you're just testing on new products or testing on a new, new, new business to determine if it's going to be profitable in the long run? Sure. I mean, so, so the two are, I'll, I'll take the two separately acquisition and, uh, lifetime value or retention. You know, the first is, you know, relatively simple to test. And I've listened to episodes of, you know, um, on your podcast of plenty of people have talked about this before, you know, it's, it's teaching yourself, um, you know, how to use Facebook ads, how to use Instagram ads. Um, if, if you have the skills and, and the, and the chops, you know, I'd recommend testing YouTube ads. Those do very well for us. Um, you know, it's teaching yourself, uh, those platforms and then running, running small tests that, you know, I'm certainly not the, the person to, to give anybody a tutorial on how to do that. So, but it's relatively a straightforward process to, to kind of test acquisition costs without, you know, having to spend tens of thousands of dollars. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's the first part, but then the second part, you know, there's really, there's really no way to know if people will come back, you know, and continue to purchase products from you. Um, so I would recommend, you know, make a, make a thesis and then kind of test it. You know, if you've got somebody that purchases a product from you, you know, what's your, what's your thesis of what they're going to come back to continue to buy and how are you going to get them to continue to buy it? So I would recommend, you know, if your thesis is, uh, um, and, and by the way, it's, you know, that's going to happen within the first month or two that they're going to come back to purchase from you, if not sooner. And so it won't take long to figure out if people are going to continue to buy products from you. So what's your thesis? You know, if I'm selling them a razor, then then I want to make sure that they come back in two months and buy my shaving cream. You know, test that uh, in MailChimp or, you know, it's an email a send uh, 12, two weeks after they purchase the razor. And what's your conversion rate on that, right? I mean, if you've got... Um, you know, a decent amount of people that actually click through your emails and purchase those additional products. And, and that's a good sign. And if not, then, you know, you may need to kind of rethink and, and make a different thesis and, and test that one as well. Based on your experience, if the, the numbers don't look great, maybe they're just at break even or something, 
can they get better over time or can it get better by much over time? Or if you were to do this, which do you want to see kind of the metrics get blown out the water in the sense that you are going to kill it in terms of a low cost of acquisition and a high retention rate before you move forward? Or is there some kind of like uh, uh, acceptable threshold for you? If you were to do this again, is there an acceptable threshold for you before you move forward with a business after this kind of testing? Sure. Um, if, if it were me and I was starting over from scratch, I mean, as far as acquisition costs go, I mean, they, they never go down. They always go up. Um, you know, anybody can tell you that. Um, so, you know, so hopefully you're better than break even on some of your acquisition costs. I mean, they will improve the more you, um, uh, you know, you, the more you get to know your customer, the better you, you figure out how to, uh, convert customers on your website. So, so there is a, a phase and towards the beginning of your business in which they will improve. Um, but you know, as you start to really scale, um, you know, acquisition costs never go down. They, they always go up. Um, so, uh, I don't know, I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but, um, yeah, I think so. I think that I think uh, there is like, like you're saying, there's a learning curve where you have to learn more about the market. Uh, but if it, if if it doesn't look good from the beginning, then it might be worth your 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 time and investment into something that's going to look great from the beginning. And why not, right? When you're just starting off, why not try to try to find something that is uh, better than just break even from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. And I I would never I would never you know discourage somebody from you know hey you ran two weeks of Facebook ads and and you know you didn't break even so go find something else. You know I, I would never discourage anybody from that. You know we, we we're constantly running new campaigns that, that don't pan out, you know, and, and we actually kind of know what we're doing now. So, um, you know, just cause, just cause some kind of acquisition channel didn't work doesn't necessarily mean it's a failure. It just means whatever you did, you know, failed and you know, try something new and, and keep trying until you think that you've got an answer on, on whether, you know, you've got a good product or not. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that if you have the skills and the chops to do YouTube ads, it's something that's worked well for your business. Uh, when it comes to YouTube ads, what do you need to learn that's different? I think a lot of the audience is familiar with running ads on like Facebook, for example. When it comes to YouTube ads, what are some new things that you need to learn to be able to, to do that successfully? Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost hesitant to, to share this, but I'm, I'm, I'm real big on YouTube. I, I think it's going to go, um, as Facebook costs go up, I think YouTube is going to con continue to be a more attractive place to advertise. There's, um, you know, not a lot of e-commerce brands are, are doing that right now. Um, so I, I'm real big on YouTube and we're going to continue to invest in that channel. And, and when I said chops, I mean, all I meant was, can you film a video and, you know, edit it? And, and that can be anything from, actually, you had a great episode a little while back about how kind of lower budget videos sometimes perform better. Mm -hmm. And we, we've, uh, you know, we've found that kind of to be the case in, in our, in our, um, in our business, you know, we don't have these really polished, you know, commercials that, that we run. Um, you know, they're certainly not junky, you know, iPhone videos either, but, um, all that to say, you know, it's, it's not all that difficult to, uh, run YouTube ads, um, uh, more difficult than Facebook, but you know, you gotta, you gotta think a lot more about, you know, what, what you're going to say in your video, you know, what, what's your, What's the point you're trying to get across? You got to think about all these sort of production value things that you don't have to think about when you just make a, you know, make an image, take a picture of your product and put it on Facebook. So that's all I meant is that it's kind of a kind of a whole next level of thinking through what you want to advertise and how. And in terms of actually running the ads, it's it's just as simple as running them on Facebook, if not more simple. Right. I think the ad content itself requires more production, so more time and potentially money to to create these ads and less it's harder to iterate on them. And so do you take like what works in other channels, like something that's easier, like uh display ads or like Facebook, for example, which are easy to tweak and then take what works there and then can, is that easy to transition over to like a YouTube video ad? So so I'll say with you know, I'll give this caveat. We we just started doing YouTube um Oh gosh, three months ago. So, you know, we're still learning right now, but, um, we, we use the same content across Facebook and YouTube, uh, personally, and, um, we see better returns on YouTube. I'm sorry, is this Facebook video ads or just, um, the regular yeah, news yeah. feed? What about, I guess the question is like, what about like, um, what about like, uh, if you aren't sure yet what to put in, into the script essentially of a YouTube ad, can you transfer what has worked for you when it comes to like just the newsfeed, regular kind of, you know, static image 
uh, copy and then try to, rec uh, I guess, replicate that in the form of a video for YouTube? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could. Um, you know, you got to think, so the ads we're running and, and the, the ads, you know, most people would recommend you run is, is what's called the true view ads, which are the five seconds uh, before that you see before, you know, YouTube videos, you see an ad that's five seconds or excuse me. It's not always five seconds. You can skip after five seconds. Um, and so our ads are actually three minutes long, but you can skip after the first five seconds. So, um, you know, I guess you could, you know, there, there are, there are kind of, uh, softwares or, or websites where you can upload images and it'll turn your images into like a slideshow video or something like that. You know, I, I think you could probably test that. I, I don't know that it would really convert all that well because, uh, you know, the, the thing you got to do in those YouTube ads is you really got to catch people within the first five seconds and give them a reason to keep watching and, and not to click the skip button. And I don't know that you can really do that um, by just flashing some product images unless unless you have some really compelling product that, that just looks amazing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I don't think that you want to take that kind of shortcut, but I'm wondering if like you can just use copy, for example, that has worked in a, in a video or sorry, in a, in a static Facebook ad and then play on that essentially in the, in the script for a YouTube ad. So you said the five seconds at the beginning are the most important because that's the time that people are essentially forced to watch and then they can skip after that. What tips do you have there for getting people to not to skip and to catch their attention in those first five seconds? Yeah. So for us, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're kind of pushing on a kind of a hot, hot button topic for me, which is, um, I hate clickbait ads. I don't, I don't like running them. I don't like anything that comes off across as clickbaity or even close to clickbaity. But at the same time, you know, they do tend to perform better than non clickbaity, you know, ads because they catch your attention and, and they, they compel a person to, to click. Um, and so what we try to do, and this is just the brand we're trying to build, um, uh, you know, as we try to take those kind of, uh, um, those techniques, kind of quick bait techniques and, and, and package them in a, in a better brand format. So, um, so, uh, the first five seconds of, of the ad that, that does best for us on YouTube right now, it shows, um, uh, it's kind of this zoomed out, uh, picture of our product sitting on a, on a bathroom sink and you can't really tell what's going on and it kind of zooms in and it's a little blurry and, and then right at five seconds, you kind of see what it is. And I think what I say, uh, you know, the, the, the voiceover is, you know, this is a, the world's closest, most comfortable shave. Don't believe me. Keep watching. The curiosity is like the thing that you're trying to, to pull out of them. That's great. Yeah. Without, be, <laughs> without being clickbaity, because like I said, that's not something that we want in our brand. But yeah, we're really trying to, to compel somebody to like, well, what is this? I've never seen something like this before. And then you're actually inviting them to keep watching. Um, and so that, that, that really works well for us. And uh, we're going to continue to test other videos with, with that kind of theme. Got it. So you mentioned earlier about Kickstarter as being a platform that you're able to validate on, but you've returned back to Kickstarter a few different times. So you launched three campaigns on there now, raising almost 80000 in that first one, I believe, and then a quarter million in the second, and then 30000 in the most recent. So I want to talk about this quarter million a Kickstarter campaign that you raised because you told me that you did this in 12 days. So tell us about this. Like, what was that? What was that process like during those 12 days to to launch a Kickstarter campaign that reached a quarter million? Sure. So yeah. For, so for context, you know, the, our first campaign with 80k that was kind of version one of our razor. Version two of our razor was the second campaign, which raised uh, 250 on on Kickstarter and then another 50 on Indiegogo. Um, so the preparation process was actually very different. I spent far less time prepping for the second campaign, uh, believe it or not, um, because I knew a few things by then. You know, I'd, I'd been through the campaign process before, you know, and so I had kind of learned a few things. You know, one of those things I learned was, you know, and this is, I'll, I'll share my experience. I don't know if this, you know, uh, translates to other campaigns, but but for us in particular, the time we put into um reaching out to press for our first campaign turned out to not really be worth it. Um, we spent a lot of time coming up with a press plan, 
Um, and the only press that, that drove results for us, which actually drove huge results for us, uh, we, we got covered by Uncrate on our first campaign. That was the only press we got that we didn't actually pitch. So we never even pitched them. They just found us. So anyways, for our second campaign, we did not spend any time thinking about press. We spent more time thinking about how are we going to activate our existing customers, um, you know, uh, encourage them to, to buy version two. Um, and then on top of that, we spent a lot of time thinking about how are we going to market um, this campaign. And so what you'll see, um, kind of a, a you know a big secret of all these huge Kickstarter campaigns. Typically, if you if you see a campaign that's you know half a million dollars, a million dollars or so, you know there's a there's a sizable uh, Facebook advertising budget that, that's behind that campaign. And we advertise we advertised for our second campaign. We didn't advertise for our first campaign, and uh, that drove probably um, I'm guessing a third of the revenue for our second campaign. So we spent a lot more time thinking about you know what's going to be our plan in terms of how are we going to spend money, when are we going to spend money, where are we going to spend money uh, to drive traffic to our campaign page. Got it. So I want to talk a little about the manufacturing process. You mentioned that that you have a dozen suppliers from all over the world, and you're you are managing the manufacturing of all of these products. How do you do this? How do you how do you how do you uh, stay on top of a dozen suppliers, manage uh, manu- and manufacturers for your products? Yeah, so um, it's it's happened slowly over time. Um, we are we are on our second manufacturer for most of our products right now. Um, my first, for example, my first manufacturer for the razor, um, I, I went down real bad. Um, uh, he delivered thousands of defective units, and um, that we we owe to our original Kickstarter backers and. Um, so, so all that to say, it's, it's not been kind of a rosy process, but over time we found manufacturers that we rely on, you know, we've built relationships with, I consider most of my POCs at those content, at those manufacturers, like they're, they're kind of friends. They're, you know, they're obviously, you know, coworkers and colleagues, but, but they're, you know, good friends of mine. I was just talking earlier, right before we got on the phone, I was talking to one of my manufacturers down in Mexico, you know, I always love hearing from him because he's become a friend of mine. So, um, it's, it's developing a relationship with them over time. And then kind of like we were, we were talking about towards the beginning, it's putting processes in place that help you to manage, um, you know, the forecasting and the planning of placing your purchase orders. So for me in particular, that, that means using this app that, that we recently started using called uh, Inventory Planner that plugs into Shopify that, that really helps us plan out when we're going to be going out of stock, when I need to be placing new purchase orders, um, so on and so forth. So um, I wish I had done that a lot sooner instead of just tracking that stuff in Excel sheets. What would you say is your biggest challenge this week? This week, my biggest challenge is, gosh, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is this week, but um, what it is, let's say this month, is planning for Q4, big surprise. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get ready for Black Friday, trying to get ready for Christmas. Um, our, uh, you know, our products are very giftable. And so last Christmas was big for us. We, we're hoping it's even bigger this year. Um, and so I'm trying to balance the fact that we don't like to do a lot of discounting. We're, we're not a discount brand. Um, with the fact that people, you know, really expect discounts during Black Friday. So uh, we're trying to think through right now, you know, what's our approach and our plan to, to um, kind of bring new customers into the fold over Black Friday without, you know, giving 50% off sales because we don't want to be that kind of brand. Got it. You definitely will pay attention to how you do that. I think this is an important uh, step for a lot of a lot of businesses that, to figure out how to to navigate Black Friday without having to take these steep cuts. So thank you so much for your time, Patrick. So GetSupply.com is the website. Where do you want to see the business be this time next year? This time next year, I, you know, I'm hoping we'll continue to grow about two x every year. I'd like I'd like for it to be more than that, but uh, slow and steady growth is is fine with me. And um, you know, we're, we're hoping. To have a full line of skincare uh, and and uh, men's uh, grooming products by about that time, so that will be a one-stop shop for all uh, your men's grooming and, and wellness needs. And uh, so that's where we hope to be in a, in about a year. Awesome! Thank you again so much, Patrick. Thanks, Felix.
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify. To get your exclusive 30-day extended trial, visit shopify.com slash masters.